I kind of titled this series that the gospel changes everything. Because what you see in this is, especially in these first few uh, chapters, is just the power of the gospel. Now, when we say gospel, this is what we mean. We mean that Jesus Christ came to earth, that God himself took on flesh, became a man, that he died on a cross, and that his death on a cross, that blood pays for our sins. And that by trusting in him, we have eternal life. He rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and now he sits at the right hand of God. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, and upon you trusting in Jesus, he puts his spirit in you. And that power is how you live. That's called divine enablement, to live through the power of Christ. And it changes us. It changes us. It makes us different people. Okay, if you could ever think of an event when you were younger, a positive event, okay, that changed your life. I have to say that because all of us are like, I don't want to see anybody twitching or anything from flashbacks, all right? A positive event that really impacted you. I'm going to share one with you that's super silly, but it really did change me, okay? Um, if I could, if, if God had not, let's put this in quotes, called me to be a pastor, I would be a professional skateboarder. It's true. Now, that may sound silly to you, but it's serious business to me. Now, I don't skate anymore, but if I, if I could do anything, you know, you ask that question, if you could do anything in the world, what would you do? If I, if I, was, if I couldn't do this, I'd do that. When I was, uh, I don't know how old I was, um, I got obsessed. I got obsessed with skateboarding. If you'd have walked into my room, uh, it totally hacked off my parents, if you'd have walked into my room when I was uh, anywhere in junior high into early high school, the every single square inch of my room was covered in skateboard tearouts of Transworld and Thrasher magazine, just ripped out and stapled and glued and pasted to the walls. Holy, man, they were so mad, all the holes I'd put in the walls. Get down, get down, get down, get down, get down, get down. I mean, it was bad. I just, I just doused the wall, I mean, because I loved it. You'd see this, and, and what these guys could do, Rodney Mullen, what he could do with a, with a skateboard was in, insane. It's just insane. It's still insane. And then there came a video that came out, and this is silly. I get it. I know. There was a video that came out in the mid-'80s. It was produced by Powell Peralta, which is a skateboard company. And the video was called The Search for Animal Chin. Anybody? Micah, thank you. I just figured somebody has to know. Bones Brigade, The Search for Animal Chin. All right, it's silly. It's, it's, a, it's about an hour-long movie where this skateboard team looks for this skateboard master, master animal chin. It's the stupidest thing ever. But what they do along their way is it, 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 they just do all these great tricks and they go to all these different cities and they skateboard and it's so much fun. And that movie, I was like, I want to do that. I want to, that's good. That's what I want to be. I, I couldn't, I wasn't very good. I mean, I got okay, but I wasn't like I was, and, and then of course all the friends that I skated with started smoking pot and getting crazy. And so I was like, I got to go. And so I you know, started do playing more sports and skating less and, and, and here I am. Okay, it was all ordained by God. All ordained by God. All of it. Now I tell you that because it, it did. It impacted me. It changed me. When I, when I saw this, uh, you know, I think I saw my first Thrasher magazine and it had this progression. I loved how they used to do that. They would take, back then, and they still do it, they would take a picture of a guy doing a trick on a skateboard and they would take these progressive photos and then they would stack them on top of each other so you could see this and in it, I was like, how? I've got to do that. I have to do this, this and, and become this man. It impact, and that's, we probably all have stories like that. That when you see something or something you've experienced, that changes you and you, it makes you different. Now, obviously I'm not a professional skater. It wasn't that impactful in my life. It was mostly impactful through junior high and early high school. But there's something that has touched me that has changed me forever. Can you guess what that is? Can you guess? It's the gospel. 
uh, a mentor, pastor, a friend of mine here in town said this. He said, I can, I've just never gotten over the gospel. I can't get over the gospel. And that's where we are for all of us. It has radically changed who you are. The capacity you now have in Christ is amazing and supersedes all that has ever happened before in your life and changes everything that will happen from this point on in your life. And there's no greater picture than what you see happen in the Philippian church. So what I want to do here is I want us to look at something. The the book of Romans says this in in chapter 1, verse 16. It says that the gospel... He says he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jews and for the Greeks. That's for them and for us. It's for the Jews and for all of us. That in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, that you and I receive something that we could not receive before, and that it is powerful to change us. And there's really no better story than than what happens to Paul and the Philippian church and the relationship they had together. So what I want to do before we get into Philippians is I want to take us back to when Paul planted the Philippian church. So Paul is in, uh, he's in Troas, okay, which is down in, in Greece. And he is, uh, he, God had really forbidden him and kind of said, no, I don't want you to go up into Europe. I don't want you to cross over the Aegean Sea and go up into Europe. I want you to stay here. These people still need you. And so he had really been, uh, the way he puts it, forbidden to go up into Europe and share the gospel at this point. And then one, one day he's in Troas, and one night he receives a dream where of, of a man calling him to come. Come, we need you over here. Come over here. So he takes that as the Lord saying, it's okay now, you can go. So Paul, Luke, Timothy, and a guy named Silas, they hop on a boat, sail across the Aegean Sea, and they make it into Philippi is the first place that they go. And when they're in Philippi, they're just kind of doing what they do. They walk into a a new city. I want you to picture this city, okay? The the best way we can do it today is to pretend like Denton is Philippi. And it is a completely pagan city. There's not a single believer in Jesus in this entire place. Not one. Not one. Everybody believes a false religion. And four Christians... Walk in, walk off, off the boat. They walk into the, down the streets and they just start meeting people. You imagine like walking into downtown, walking onto the square and they just start talking to people. You probably have been on the square and seen Paul's and Timothy's and Silas's, right? And Luke's all standing around, handing out tracts, talking to people. Well, that's what they did. They went in there and they just started talking to people. They met a girl named Lydia who was a merchant there. She was a businesswoman. And they, they started talking with her. She believed in God, the single monotheistically. And when she found out who Jesus would, was she trusted in him. And it changed her life. She's the first convert in Philippi, in the city. And then as they're going on, there's a slave girl that's following them around. And she's possessed by a demon. And she's telling fortunes for her masters, making them money. And she's going around. And, and as she sees Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke going through the city, she starts crying out, these men are of, of the Most High God. They speak of salvation. And she just is following them. And you could see in the beginning, it's kind of funny how the story in Acts 16 goes, they, they kind of pay her no attention in the beginning. But pretty soon they realize what's happening, that this girl isn't just like, she's compelled. This demon in her is compelled to witness about who these men are. And it actually frustrates Paul to the point where he turns on her and he casts this demon out of her. Almost like, I can almost see him getting mad, like, woman, get away! And he keeps happening. And finally he turns and he says, boom! You get out of here, buddy. And she, the demon's cast out. Well, her ability to tell the fortunes of people is now gone. She trusts in Jesus Christ, becomes a convert. She goes back to her masters, and they're mad because now they can't make any money. So I want you to picture Denton, Texas, no Christians, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke in the square making all the merchants mad. LSA can no longer sell burgers because their fortune-telling waitresses are no longer there. All right? And in this process, they go to the authorities, 
They say these men are disrupting the city. They're throwing the city into a fit. You got to do something. So they could find two of them. They found Paul and they found Silas and they grabbed them. And they, they didn't try them. They beat them. It's the first thing you do, right? Why bother, why bother the authorities? Let's take care of this. Boom, you get them in an alley, you beat the snot out of them, and then you throw them in jail. And that's what they did. So here is the point where I want you to see the power of the gospel. Okay? I'm going to put some verses up on the screen in just a second. If this was you, how would you react? If you had gotten beaten, if you gotten thrown in jail for doing nothing <coughs> illegal, nothing wrong whatsoever, there was no trial, there was no, there was no uh, lawyers involved, you just got beat and tossed in prison, how would you feel? Well, if you're like me, I'd be, I'd be upset. I'd be mad. And I wouldn't be, have joy in my heart. I'm the kind of guy to be like, all right, how can we get this guy back? What can we do to hurt them? That's my personal, that's what I would want to do. How can we, how can we make them pay for what they've done? I got it. I'm going to light their dog on fire. They don't mess with me no more. Burning dog running around their house. See? How wicked is that? That's what you would have done too. Don't laugh, you know you would have. Okay, so here's my point. We would not be doing what Paul and Silas did. This is a beautiful picture of how the gospel changes us. Look at the screen. So they're in prison. Verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. That's their reaction. That's a reaction for a good hard beating, nicely locked in prison, shackled to the floor. That's their reaction. Now I want you to think about something. Paul, the reason he can sit here and sing is because Paul deserves to be in this prison. You need to remember who Paul is. Paul's a persecutor of the Jews. In his mind, as a convert, he's the lowest of lows. He's a guy who went around uh, beating people, accusing people, throwing Christians in prison, and now here he is. I deserve this. Well, let's sing. Let's praise the Lord. He's not in a position where he's thinking, I shouldn't be here. Something is wrong. They have done something. This is illegal. I'm a Roman citizen. How dare you? didn't even have a trial. It's on. That's the flesh, right? But the Spirit has changed him. He deserves to be there, but he's not mad. He's singing. That is the power of the gospel. Now watch what happens. He's singing. Look what everybody else is doing. They're listening. They're hearing the praise. They're hearing about this God. you got to remember, all these guys stuck in prison, they've probably been there a while. They're all pagans. And they're hearing these guys do something that they would have never done. They would never be singing, Ah, oh, Zeus, you're the best God. Apollos, you're cool too. They would never have been doing that. They're, they're in awe. That Why? Would you sing? Why would you sing to a God who's obviously must have cursed you? Look where you are. They're listening. Look at the, look at the screen. Prisoners were listening, and then suddenly there came a great earthquake. I want you to notice, does it say that God caused the earthquake? It doesn't, does it? Could it just naturally happen? Could it just been fortuitous, right? Could it just been, woo -hoo? But notice what happened. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately the doors came loose. They were open. That could have happened naturally, right? Earthquakes shake buildings to the ground. You can see... <laughs> you can see the door. That could happen, right? This could not have happened naturally. And everyone's chains were unfastened. This is what tells us this is of God. Here's an earthquake. Doors loosen up. And then... Doors, <laughs> chains. What? That wasn't natural. That was supernatural. God opened all this. And what you see happen after this is the, the jailer wakes up because it's midnight. He panics. 
thinks everybody's, he sees the doors open, thinks all the prisoners have left. He begins to freak out, grabs his sword. There's nothing worth living for. And he goes to fall on his sword and Paul yells, what are you doing? Stop it. We are all still here. Another testament to the change. If I was in jail and the doors came open and the prison, the guard was asleep, dude, I'm sneaking out. That's the flesh. I'm not sticking around. I'm here illegally. Let's sneak out. We'll get back on the boat. We'll go back across the Aegean. Tro- the people of Troas really liked us. Let's go back there. But he doesn't. He's like, everybody stay just, just, just go. Just go watch what happens. Just go. Dude, what are you doing? We're all here. Don't kill yourself. Look what happens. Look at the next few verses back down to 29. The, the jailer calls for lights. They rush in, trembling with fear. He went to fall before Paul and Silas, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That was his response to seeing something almost irrational in Paul and Silas. Why was it irrational? Because the gospel changes everything. Whoever it touches, whatever it touches, whoever hears it, you cannot be the same. And when you take it in and you trust in it, it will change your life. That is, in my opinion, the theme of Philippians. Because here we are, here we are, the book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippian church, 11 years after this. 11 years after Acts 16, Philippians, the letter gets written. He says, what must I do to be saved? And what what does uh, Paul say to him? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust what you've heard us singing about. Trust in this God who came to earth. Trust in the Savior who died for your sins. Trust in his resurrection. Trust that he is who the Bible says he is, that he can do what the Bible says he can do, that he will do what the Bible says he will do. That's the gospel. The guy trusts Jesus, takes him back to his house, tells his family, his family trusts in Christ, baptizes the whole lot of them that night. Then he, then, he, then he says, you guys got to get out of here. The jailer says, nope. We need to go stand before the magistrate. We're Romans. They beat us. We want to tell them about Jesus. Didn't want to leave because he still had people to share Christ with. That's the Philippian church. From that moment, the church grows. They became so in love with Paul that they became strong supporters of Paul. Okay. And now, interestingly enough, 11 years later, Paul is in prison again. This time, he's in prison in Rome, okay? This is uh, towards the end of his life. He's in, this is one of uh, just a few prison epistles that we have from Rome. And here he is. He's in Rome, and he has received <coughs> a care package from the Philippian church, a church that he started 11 years earlier, and they sent this guy named Epaphroditus to him to minister to him. And now he writes the book of Philippians. So here's what I want us to do. Let's look at the text now. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Let's walk through this. This First, we're going to see, before we get to the real question I want to ask, let's look at how he addresses everybody. He says, from Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. The word bond servants there is a term that James used to describe himself, the half-brother of Jesus. Jude used it to describe himself. Paul used it. Peter used it to describe himself. John used it used it in the book of Revelation to describe himself. These are terms not necessarily in terms of authority, but terms of humility. Normally, when Paul would address people, he would address Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. You know why he would do that? Because whatever he's about to say needs to have authority behind it. In this letter, notice he doesn't do that. Paul, a bondservant, a, a, a slave of Christ, a doulos, one who is who has submitted himself into slavery for Jesus. I I am nobody. And notice it sets the tenor for the rest of the book because he doesn't give a lot of imperatives. It's very personal from this point. Look at who he's writing to. It says, To the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. This word saints is specific, a title that reflects the the justification of a Christian who stands before God. This isn't the... uh, necessarily the idea that you have done a couple of miracles and now a church is going to recognize you. That's when you see like St. Uh, Saint Augustine or St. Saint, uh, did, didn't uh, uh, 
the late uh, Pope John Paul just received sainthood. Um, that's a, this is not what that is. This is a term, generalized term for all of us. This is our standing before Christ. Okay? Justified. It says to all the saints in Philippi. And notice what he says. He says, including the overseers and the deacons. He doesn't say this in any other book. He doesn't address a letter to a specific church, to a specific group within that church. Okay? He includes these guys because he, he, there's this aspect of their leadership that is important. He wants to make sure that these guys specifically get this note, get this letter. Grace to you and peace from God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Real fast, to give you a, a definition so that you understand. The word overseer is episkopos. It's the elder. Okay, It's the elder. The superintendent is another way, phrase for what the, the overseer there is. The word deacon, diakonos, is, is the one who serves. It's the idea of a waiter. You're going to go to Chili's after lunch. You're going to sit down. And you're going to shake the hand of your deacon who's serving you. It's the idea. That within the church, there's these men and women specifically. It's funny. Um, there's an argument for the possibility of women serving as deacons in the Bible. Serving the church. That's what they are. Keep looking. It says, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now he gets to something. He's going, we have to ask this question. When you see throughout this book, when if I say Paul is, is, has a deep relationship for these folks, we have to ask the question, why? Because that's what he addresses in the first several verses. From verse 3 on down to verse 8, he addresses why he is so grateful for this church specifically. Look at your text. The first thing he's going to show is because of their support. Look in verse 1. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrances of you, always offering prayers with joy in my every prayer for you all. The idea, there's, there's several different ideas behind this is, one uh, reading of the text, grammatical reading of the text, is that he's thanking his God for the support they've given him, not just in his remembrances of them, but in their remembrances of him, how they have always supported him. And so the idea here is the joy. I want you to think about someone in your life that when you think about them, it brings you joy. Do you got anybody? Do you got a face? Do you got a name? And when you think about this person, they may not be here, they may not be in this room, they may be somebody in another state, but when you think about them, you think about them with joy. Whenever we, uh, me and Jolene, helped plant a church in Little Rock, uh, we had to raise support. It was the first time, we had raised support for some short-term missions, but we'd never had to raise support to live on. And uh, I can remember going around, telling people what we're going to do, soliciting support. We weren't really just soliciting money. I, I wanted. Pe I knew that we couldn't go and do this without partners, without prayer partners, without people that, that loved us and were going to constantly be lifting us up. But I'm, a, I'm not a good sales guy because I, I don't close the deal. I'm not a deal closer. I don't walk up and go, hey, man, this is what we're doing. We're planting this church. It's going to be amazing. God's going to do this. God's going to do this. God's going to do this, blah, 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 blah. How about it, man? You in? You ready to do this? You know you want to. Come on, man. Jump in with me. Change your life. Come on. I'm just, I can't do that. So I have such a struggle. I was like, this is what we're doing. Bye. You know, I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. It was awesome. And I can remember when Jolene and I started receiving support letters. Checks. Care packages. Notes from people. We love you. We are proud of you. You know what it did? It humbled me. To have someone not just given to an organization on my behalf, but give to me and to my wife. It was special. I felt important to them. It created a bond. We, me and Jolene have uh, some friends. Uh, I'm going to say them. I'm going to put them on tape. They're going to be on video. Or tape. Tape doesn't exist. I'm going to put them on, on electronic copy somewhere. Uh, the, the McNeils, Todd and Erica McNeil, they're family, friends of ours who we met in Little Rock. They supported us in our church plant in Little Rock. Um, they were some of the first supporters of Benchmark Bible Church. 
They live in Alabama. They still support Pittsburgh Bible Church. There's a bond. Something happens here. And all of my remembrances of you, I rem- I, it brings joy to me when I, and I pray to God with joy for you. So it's because of their support that he's so grateful. Look at the second thing. Look in verse 4. Not only is it because of their support, or excuse me, verse 5. Not only because of their support, but notice it's because of their faithfulness. Aren't we attracted to faithfulness? We're attracted to a faithful people. If somebody wasn't faithful, would you want to be near them? Do you want to hang out with them? If they're here today, gone tomorrow, they don't make a lasting impression. But notice what he says. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, he's always praying for you. I remember you with joy because you are faithful from day one. Remember day one, everybody? Philippian church, remember day one when I, we walked in the street? Lydia, remember day one? Servant girl that I can't remember your name because it's not in the Bible. Remember day one when you were relieved of this demonic oppression? And look at you, you're still here. You're still here. I'm going to do something really weird. And it's going to put you on the spot. Um, If you were here at Benchmark, so when Benchmark started, there was about 20 people that kind of started it, okay, back in the day. There's probably some people that are just not here today. But if you were here kind of even before we really even launched, or right at the first of the launch of the church, if you have been here since then, would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. You're so special. Okay, that doesn't mean the rest of you aren't special. You're all special too, okay? Everybody's special. We should all get participation trophies. Um you're all here. You're participating. Get a trophy. No. No, but but from the first day till now, they're still here. Do you think that ministers to me? Do you think that blesses me and my wife? It does. It does. Look at the next thing. So they're faithful. Notice what else he says. He moves into this. He kind of shifts gears a second. He's He's uh, grateful for their support. He's grateful for their faithfulness. But notice this. He's also grateful because of something that Christ is doing. The work of Christ in them. Because they can't do... It's almost like he notices these things you could not have done without the work of Christ in you. And look at the text. It says, For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. Perfect it. Something's going to happen. Christ's work in them is continuing. Christ is doing something, uh, and he's taking it to its completion. Let me give you, uh, I'm going to explain this word. Me and Walt were talking about this yesterday on the golf course. I think it's really a great, a great word for us. The word here for, compl- or for uh, perfect is the word epitelio, okay? And it's this idea of something being brought to its end. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to compare this word to a word here in a, in a little bit that we're going to see uh, uh, being full. This is different from being filled up or being full. This is the word of being uh, brought to its end or being brought to its purpose. Um, it's the idea of being completed or accomplishing one's purpose. So ultimately, there's this concept here that Christ is doing something where he is bringing to fruition the purposes that each one of these Philippians who were in this church, were made for. Let me give you an idea. Here's an illustration. And uh, Jason, you ready to work with me? Uh, pull up this microphone on that crazy new soundboard we got back there. Okay, pull up this microphone. Get ready to use it. This microphone has a purpose. Okay? It's accomplishing. It's being perfected right now. Can you hear it? Can you hear it being perfected? Its purpose is to, uh, to amplify the sound to take the sound in and to send it back to the board so that it can be amplified. Now, you're ready for this, this microphone to not complete its purpose? Turn me up. And that is how you save the world. You get it? 
Now that when it's not completing its purpose, there's this concept of frustration, right? Do you ever feel like a frustrated Christian? Do you ever feel like God has called you to something? That there's this greater purpose that... It, and, and I'm not saying that... that, that I'll, I'm not talking vocationally, okay, folks? I'm just talking about personally, in your heart, in your life. That there's something greater that's being missed. Being frustrated in you because God's purpose is being thwarted by you. So what God is doing here in the church of Philippi is he's, he, and Paul can see it, he's completing this work. He's carrying it out. He's working in them. And he's grateful for that. Look at the next set of verses, verse 7 through 8. Not only is he uh, grateful for their support, for their faithfulness, for the work of Christ in them, but he's grateful for their partnership. Can I just tell you, we've got a group right now leaving on a mission trip uh, in, to Spain in July. And this is something, we had a meeting last week and I was, I was explaining this to them. You are looking for people to become partners. What does a partner do? A partner works with you. A partner brings support, brings care, brings prayer. They're in this with you. It's like think of a foxhole with a guy next to you. You're not in it alone. That's a partner. And this is who they are to Paul. Look at what he says in verse uh, 7. It says, For it is only right that I feel this way about you, because you have, excuse me, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. You've been there with me. You haven't let me stay alone. You sent Epaphroditus. He brought cookies. He brought letters. <clears throat> he bought my favorite candies. He brought encouragement from you. Because you are in this with me. What an encouragement. Stop. Is community important? You know what? Community is not important if you're not in the fight. If you're not in the fight, I want to say this boldly. Community is not going to be important to you. Community is really important. It's really important to the brothers and the sisters who are fighting in the name of Jesus Christ. That's when community becomes important. If not, it's just whatever. See, it's important to him. It's a partnership to him. Keep looking. It says, you're partakers with me in the grace of God. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affections of Jesus. That's how personal this gets. I want to stop. The reason I want to focus on this is because what could, would you write a letter to anybody right now and say, I long for you with the affections of Christ. Most of us, maybe a spouse, right? But probably not anybody else. That's how important these people are. You see the difference? You see why this is such a big deal? Most of us will go through this and go, a lot of you the affections of Jesus Christ, we keep moving. Oh, I want to get to this verse because the verse 9 is really awesome. That's where we go. And I want us to stop because this is the tenor with which the rest of this book is going to be is going to be carried on with the affections of Christ. All right, so now we have to answer or ask another question. So the first one is, why is he so grateful for these people? And the next thing is, if, if he was going to pray for them, which he just said, when I pray for you, when I remember you in my prayers, this is, you know, it's because of these things. And now he's going to explain to them what he actually prays for them. So what is Paul praying for his friends? What is he going to pray? Now, there's a list of seven things here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the verse, and then I'm going to hit these last seven things, and we're going to finish up, okay? So let's hit the verse first. In verse 9, he says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. The first thing that you see is he starts with love. What's the most important thing that the Philippian church, that you and I can have, growing in us more and more. And it is our love. Not just specifically love for the world or love for things. Specifically, it's our love for Jesus Christ. He's going to make that very evident as we move through the text. That your love for God would abound more and more. I, I, 
can't say this enough. It's not just about growing in understanding and knowledge and community and fellowship and all that. It's about your heart being affected so much by the gospel that the love that you have for Jesus Christ grows more and more and more and more and more and more and more. That's the prayer. It's like a seed. So I want you to pretend like this is the seed by which everything else grows. We plant that in the ground, okay? And now something's going to spring up. That's going to lead to something. It's going to lead to knowledge. So it's the more and more in real knowledge. This is epinosis or full knowledge, complete knowledge, and in all discernment. So you have this trunk that comes up. Knowledge and discernment. The more you know, the more you're able to discern. And what are you trying to discern? The things that are excellent. Look at what he says. So that you may approve the things that are excellent. You're trying to, this is the idea of having a sh sharper convictions. As your discernment grows, the sharper your discernment, the higher your convictions are. You can now see what's excellent. Think back to before Jesus in your life, in your heart. What was excellent to you? Is it the same things that's excellent to you now? Probably not. I'm just going to say it. They're probably not the same things. Convictions get sharper. Excuse me. The discernment gets sharper. The convictions get higher. Look what else he says. In order to be sincere, the word here, uh, the Greek word is really pure. To be pure, and this is inwardly. Notice he's saying that as your discernment gets sharper, your convictions get higher. Inwardly, you're, be, you're being refined. You're being purified. And notice what happens outwardly. Sincere and blameless. Apostopos is the word for blameless. And really what it means is to not stumble. It's interesting. It's the idea of not stumbling over something, not tripping and falling, so that you can become pure outwardly and not stumble. Excuse me, become pure inwardly and not stumble outwardly. Keep looking. Until the day of Christ. He said this the second time he said that. He is fixed on the church doing something until the end, till the very end. We don't give up. We don't stop. This is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. Your love will abound. Your love will grow. Your knowledge will grow. Your discernment must grow. Your convictions must be deeper. Your life must be pure. Until the end. Until the day of Christ. All the way to the end. And so as you see this tree grow, now it's, it's putting blossoms on. It's budding. And notice what happens. Verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness. The word filled here is plero. And this is different than completed. Okay, this is different. This doesn't mean necessarily, uh, or excuse me, this is different than being uh, accomplished or the purpose being brought to its end, which is what you see in epitilio. This is the word for ultimately lacking nothing, being filled up. So it's idea of the fruit of righteousness, that your tree, is it, I have, a, I have an apple tree in my backyard that doesn't produce apples. I bought the tree on the tag, back up, on the internet. It said this tree will produce fruit its first year. It, it, they had grown it, they had spliced it in, it, I got them, plant it, boom, nothing. Is this year three with this silly tree? Not an apple. It is not full. It is not plyro o. It is empty. And so the idea of this life, love being the seed, knowledge and discernment growing up, spreading out to sharper convictions, or excuse me, sharper discernment, higher convictions, a purity of inward life, a blamelessness of outward life, leading ultimately to what? The fruit of God's righteousness in us, being all over the tree, full, filled. Now, I want you to go home. This is, a, this is an exercise for you today, tonight, where, whenever. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment. I want you to open your Bible. I want you to come to this text, 9, 10, and 11, chapter 1. And I want you to go somewhere where it's just you. Maybe grab your spouse. You can do it together. That'd be fun. Do that. Make it closer. 
And I want you to pray. I want you to think of one person. You know, I think of me. And pray this prayer. Would you do that? Think of one person. Think of somebody that you know that you want this to happen to. Can you think of them? Do you think that would change their life? Then better yet, write them a note. Tell them you've been praying for them. And send this to them. Say, this is what I pray for you. What do you think is going to happen to that relationship? (laughs) They're going to change. You're going to change. That relationship's going to change. So here's the final question. Let's finish this. Here's the final question. Remember when I said that Denton, we're going to pretend like Denton is Philippi? Let's pretend like Denton is Philippi. Let's pretend like we've come, we've just received this letter from this guy who came to Denton and shared Christ to the first merchants in downtown and changed lives. And you and I are all sitting here now because of this guy 11 years earlier. Would he write this letter to us? Would he say this about you? Could he say this about Benchmark Bible Church? Could he, could, would that guy say all these amazing things about you and me? See, that's our prayer. I want to stand before God. Can't wait. Well, I can, kind of. There's a little apprehension. Because I want him to say this. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you a few talents. You did awesome. You multiplied them like crazy. That's what I want him to say. But there's some apprehension in my heart. Like, did I, what, did I, have I really lived that life? Is that really who I am on the inside? Am I just performing outwardly because it's checking off a list? Is that really what God has done in me? See, I want to stand before him, and I want him to say those things. I want Paul to write a letter to, to me saying, you have done, gosh, I thank God every time I remember you because of how faithful you are and the work he's done in you, your partnership and for your support. And when I pray, I pray this. That's, I want him to say that to me. I want him to say that to all of us. I want this letter to be Benchmark Bible Church's letter in the future forever as this church grows and continues ministry i'd love 11 years from now to us to look back on this moment and go oh my gosh lord you have done such an amazing thing in all of us our lives are completely different this city is a completely changed place because of the power of the gospel christ is that what you want you want that if you want that you're in the right place because I want that too.